Hello everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero Show, where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we've got some parsing to do today, probably. Uh, I'll catch you up if you missed yesterday's stream <clears throat> as to what's going on here. So we have art stuff we want to put in the game. That's what we've been doing. Uh, and we have a situation where we finished importing all of our art assets and doing that sort of thing. But we now have like some assembly that we need to do in order to like put our stuff together, right? Um, and you can kind of see here, I'm, I'm a ridiculously huge cat now for no apparent reason. Um, but if you take a look at like when we place things in the world, right, everything's all discombobulated. Like the heads and the bodies, they all just show up centered around whatever the placement point is. We have no coherent way of like placing these things so that the heads go on top of bodies and stuff like that. And that expands more generally to other types of things you might want to do. For example, uh, if you want to have heads that um, go on top of bodies and then hats that go on top of heads and so on, you kind of have this idea that there are points inside these objects, uh, inside these bitmaps that, you know, kind of have to snap together. And we need to have ways of like selecting that sort of information and, you know, basically preparing uh, something useful to happen there. You know, we, we just need something to, to uh, we need some way to make that work. And so what we're trying to do now is get that going. And what we did is we augmented our ability uh, to store this uh, data. Remember, we have an HHA file format that stores game data for us. We um, go in here. Uh, in our data directory, we have this concept um, of HHA files, and we augmented them yesterday to include uh, a bunch of information that could be used to create exactly uh, the thing in question here, right? The, exactly is the, the ability to snap things together using points. Um, and we made it so that it, you know, could import old ones and work the way it used to as well, but also support this new stuff. And so we have these, this new idea of alignment points, and each asset can have a set of alignment points in it. So in addition to tagging it with like, why you might want to use this resource in a gameplay sense. Um, we also now have alignment that says, if you're using this resource with other resources, how might it snap together? Um, and so we have two things we need to be able to do now. Um, and one of those things has two parts. So you might say we have three things we have to write. Number one is we have to actually use these things. Like supplying the placement points doesn't really help if we don't have any code that actually then tries to snap things together using those points. So that's the thing we got to do. And then another thing we have to do is get the data in there. So we have to have a way of, of actually putting in the information about where we want these things. You know, where does the head snap onto the body and stuff like that. <clears throat> so that's the part that has two parts to it. One is we need a way of storing that stuff in some kind of form that we can consider authoritative and permanent, which means probably not the HHA files because that's supposed to be our runtime format that we can delete and rebuild if we want to change how the runtime format works or stuff like that. Uh, so we probably don't want to rely on it being stored permanently in there. And it's actual work that we're doing. We're actually spending time to like place these points. We want to preserve that work so you don't have to redo it uh, every time we want to rebuild our HHAs or something. Um, so we need some way of storing that permanently. I was suggesting just a simple text file that corresponds to the PNG. So it's just, you know, again, the simplest possible thing, nothing too complicated. Uh, so we would need some way of parsing those text files and then uh, taking that information and placing it into the HHA uh, when we actually do our art importing. So that's, you know, one thing. The other thing that we want to do is have a way of seeing those results and editing them in real time. Because what we'd like to be able to do is make it really, really easy uh, to set all of those parameters to exactly what we want. So, you know, one way we could do it is just constantly tweak the text file and then see what the results were and tweak the text file until it's right. Uh, and that's the simplest solution in terms of programming because it doesn't require anything other than the, just the text import and that's it. Um, but if we really wanted to make it easy for us to do large batches of these assets without too much fuss, uh, then I think we want something a little bit uh, more uh, complete we would like some way of having those text files be like graphically editable, right? Like we would like some way um, we would like some way of 
taking the like look, making a user interface inside the game we can just at any time say oh those two things need, need like need to line up like this and then that information just gets saved back into the text file for us right and that's just a way of simplifying that process so that it's not um you know a big deal to adjust it and it doesn't take a bunch of time and wasted energy having that import work right so that's all we're trying to do here. It's really pretty simple, you know, right? There's not much to it. Um, but it's just, uh, there's a bunch of grunt work involved. So we kind of got to go do that grunt work if we want this thing to work out uh, okay. Uh, so that's all we're talking about. That's uh, what I want to do now. And so we just got to get started. Now, like I said, where we're at here, we kind of have to imagine um, uh, getting this stuff to work right. So I don't know where, where the best place to start is. You know, one way might be to say, let's go ahead and try to, try to make the edit part. We'll just start with that, right? So we'll start by trying to make the thing that allows us to, you know, edit those placement points. Um, and then we'll go from there. So, you know, if we wanted to edit that sprite, we saw, you know, we see that it's wrong. Um, and we need to be able to mark it up. So we need to be able to take this one and, and make a placement point on it. And we need to be able to take this one and, and make a placement point on it and then have those things snap together in some kind of a satisfying way. Um, that would be what we're trying to, that, that's the goal we're trying to accomplish here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so let's think about how we would do this when we actually have stuff that's incorrect on, on, uh, on the screen. How are we going to fix it, right? And one of the things that we have here is if we were to pick one, of, if, you know, if we were to have some kind of an editing mode we could go into where we can pick uh, these things here, uh, we would then have to, you know, maybe show something, I don't know, like using the debug UI or using something. We would have to have some way that we could show uh, what's going on with, with one of these entities uh, and allow us to add or adjust points in the entities. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's kind of what we would want to do here. Now, this is a little bit interesting because in some senses, this isn't really a debug UI. Um, it's hard to say. Like, one of the things I think we probably didn't do very good on Handmade Hero is respect the fact that the debug UI maybe isn't really a debug UI, or at least a lot of the things that would be going on debug UI maybe shouldn't be debug UI. Like maybe they should actually just be systems that are part of the main game. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because since Handmade Hero is a teaching tool, it means that probably you wanna just let people play with the internals, even in the shipping version of the game. You don't wanna do the same kind of architecture you would do in a normal game where you're trying to actively remove all that stuff when you ship it. Like you don't want any of those things uh, to be in the game. You want those things to be uh, compiled out completely and not ship at all. And so we kind of have a little bit of a potential mistake there just in terms of philosophical mistake in terms of, or, or you know, philosophical is probably the wrong term, uh, but maybe I'll say a, a mistake regarding what the goal uh, is of any particular system. And so we may want to think a little bit more critically about that and start to move it away from that a little bit more. And so when we're talking about this, you know, maybe we want this to be something that you can just do in the game. You know, like if you decide to go into a debug mode uh, in the actual game proper, then you maybe can just do, uh, you know, you can just get at this stuff all the time. So it's not something that would be removed from the game in the shipping version like we normally would uh, if we were making a game that was not, that did not have a teaching component to it, if that makes sense. So we can keep that in mind. So if we go in here to the entity system, for example, um, you know, we've got a, a notion that we may want to, you can see here where we've got like debug pick entity, right? Uh, and we've got some stuff about that. And, you know, maybe what we want to do, I guess what I'm saying is maybe we want to make this picking procedure be a little bit uh, more uh, integrated into the game so that you just have a way of going into a debug mode. Uh, and if you go into that debug mode, then you can start clicking on things. You know, that's just how it works or whatever, right? Uh, it's just a thought. So if I want to do something like that, what I could do is when we're doing our picking here, right? 
Uh, what I could do is have a thing that checks to see what mode we're in uh, in the game, right? You know, like check something. What kind of mode am I in? Am I in a mode where I, I should be able to edit something? Uh, and then if I are, if I, if I are, wow, that's good. If I am, uh, then I would like to do some picking, perhaps maybe on these like piece in indexes or whatever here, right? And one of the things that we know is, you know, we've already written code uh, in to, to do box intersection. Um, so we kind of have ways already of picking uh, things in the world using rays because we already have uh, a notion of, we already have multiple notions. We have things that can intersect rays and boxes. Uh, so for example, in our lighting code, uh, we already wrote things that do this. So if you look at, for example, uh, where we do our ray casting, you know, we already wrote a bunch of code uh, that does testing of rays versus boxes. And in fact, we have an optimized one even uh, that tests a bunch of rays and boxes at the same time um, and stuff like that, right? So we have the notion of a box intersection. We also uh, have the understanding of how to unproject points. So if we go into the renderer itself, uh, there's actually an unproject in here. And what you can see is when you call this, you can actually get, you know, if you say, here is what clip space is, you know, here's what, um, here's where my uh, point is on the screen. And then you can say, if I was this far away from the camera, where would I be? Like where, you know, in, in the world would I be, right? Uh, so we actually have multiple ways of doing this. And it seems like at this point we could even just, we don't really even need box intersection because if we have the ability to do a 3D reverse projection at a particular distance, we could just say, look, where is this entity piece that we're talking about? Let's go ahead and just do a projection back to that Z depth. And then we'll look to see if we're inside a rectangle that's roughly the size of the sprite, right? Because again, this isn't part of gameplay. So it doesn't need to be exact. We just need an easy way of looking at something on the screen and selecting it, right? Um, because that way we don't have to go looking through some, we don't have to make like a lister that lists all the sprites and, you know, we pick them and whatever. We can just, when we see something that's off wrong, we can just fix it right there. You know, it's pretty nice and handy in that sense, right? So let's just do that. You know, let's just see what happens if we just did that, right? So we have a render group that we know that we're drawing these things in. Um, and we know that we have these piece indexes and all this stuff, right? And we know we can, so we can know we can do a crappy like hit test without too much trouble if we want to. And I'll just turn this on by default. We're worried about where the, worry about where the mode switch is later. So then in here, you know, when we're actually looking at this stuff, um, I'll just pretend that everything's a cube for now. And we'll just take a look at what that cube information is. Uh, and we'll just say like, all right, so, you know, here's where the thing would be, right? Uh, and here's how big the thing would be. Uh, and so if we have that information, we know the, the world P of the piece. Uh, we know the world dim of the piece. And it's not exactly right because we interpret it somewhat differently, but we can start regularizing that stuff a little bit more or, or make this code more exact by checking what kind we're working with, who knows, right? Um, but what we could do first is just say, all right, so let's just, um, actually, let me do it this way. Uh, let's just first say, okay, you know, if we were going to actually put one of these things in here um, and we wanted for every sprite to just draw a little rectangle, um, what would it look like? So I'm just gonna start by, first of all, pushing a rectangle on there to make sure we've got some representation of the pieces at all. That's all I wanna do is just get that right to begin with, right? Um, and so here I'm gonna take a look at, at where those things are, you know what I mean? Um, and just try to figure out what's going on. So what you can see here is we've got some weird That's kind of cool. Uh, we've got some weird placements of those rectangles. I'm not sure what exactly that's doing. 
uh, this is the energy transform offset P plus the piece offset, right? I'm not sure exactly. Let me go to the render here. I'll be honest, I don't really remember what push rect even does. Oh. All right. So here's object transform offset and dimension, right? So I'm passing the dimension I want to draw here. I'm passing the world P here. So it does a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, so I don't really want to be using this. I want to use something that's more specific, right? Um, so I probably want to do I'm not sure what, you know, maybe this is a little bit better. So here it, it does push rect outline is really probably what I wanted because the other one's a little bit nuts, right? It's, it's doing totally different stuff in terms of how it's going to uh, interpret the, interpret the rectangle. Let me see if this is a little bit better for us. To, yeah. Um, so that makes a little more sense there, but only a little. And it kind of looks like, it looks like it's scaled out wrong. Like everything is bigger than it should be, right? Because if I was to push a cube, I should get exactly the same locations as I was getting with everything else, right? And again, I just want to make sure that I get uh, this stuff correct. I don't really want a bitmap ID in there. Um, so I want to just be able to draw something that's a non, that doesn't really have, uh, I want to be able to draw something that doesn't really have any, um, weirdness to it on the, you know, on the cube front here. I guess the other problem, so I guess the other problem is entity transform automatically has that baked into it. So that's probably actually what I was seeing there. So that makes some sense. So probably this is actually what what I was seeing. Right. Um, I was applying the entity transform twice because it's already going to get applied automatically by that routine. Yeah, there we go. So that, that was just me being stupid. Um, so if I go look at where those are, they're kind of embedded in objects most of the time, as you can see. Um, and that's exactly what we would expect uh, to see happen there to a large extent. I want to see if I can get the world dim stuff a little bit better. Just see if I can approximate the size of these things. Um, but now we're kind of in better shape here. Kind of need a wireframe render mode. I also need, I need better like debug camera controls. I need a lot of things. Um, so looking at that, it looks like it's got the Y and not the X, which makes perfect sense because the way that we did things in the um, in the bitmap rendering is you just kind of pass down a dimension in Y and it blows the X out for you, right? Um, so when we're actually doing this in a sense, you know, that that part is actually being taken care of inside the thing that looks up what the bitmap itself actually would be. Uh, and so, you know, for us, it's a little bit trickier because we don't really know uh, what it should be at this point. 
so you know hard to say how we want to handle that going forward uh but you know for the moment if we did this we wouldn't be too far off we'd be a little bit far off in certain circumstances depending on the eccentricity of the thing involved but you know um it's not the worst approximation at the moment uh so again there's the cat right and now you can see that those rectangles would be uh pickable and so we should now be able to write something that just kind of selects uh, very easily, can select something uh, so that we you know, can, can highlight things by just looking at where they are uh, and maybe get a little bit of, um, just get a little bit cleaner in terms of like how we're, uh, how we're gonna pick objects to edit at any particular time. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, allow that to happen. So if I come in here and I want to do a pick, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to first check to see a, what it would look like if I just highlight things that are uh, under the mouse cursor so we can see whether or not we can pick them properly. Uh, and if I do an unproject here, like so, uh, I should be able to get back a uh, cursor in world kind of a thing. So I should be able to take like wherever the mouse is and I should be able to do that transform to figure out what's going on. You know what I mean? Uh, and so in order to get the render group transform, we know that it's just whatever the current transform is, right? Um, but I don't want the games transform. I want the debug transform because if I'm in debug camera mode, I want to be able to pick from there. So I'm going to pass the debug transform uh, as the default one because we always want to use that uh, rather than the game one in the case where the game uh, is in debug mode. So the clip space X, Y, we need to know where the mouse cursor is. We'll do that in a second. World distance from camera Z, we know what that is um, because we know, we know how far this world point is from the camera if we want to because we can just figure out where the, um, we can just use the delta between um, the camera and the sprite's location, and we can just measure that along the camera's z-axis, right? So it's not that hard to get that right. Um, in fact, it's pretty easy. So our big problem is getting the clip space X, Y, and to do that right, what we'd have to do is we have to be able to look up where the mouse actually is. Now, fortunately, we know where the mouse probably is um, because we can feed that information forwards. Now, the problem that we're gonna have, of course, is that uh, that doesn't come into the update and render entities. That's okay, because I don't know that we necessarily even need to be in here. Um, you know, we may want this to be, uh, you know, the, we may want this to be something that happens outside of, of, of there anyway. Um, and that happens in world mode or in some kind of code that's like, you know, the picking part of world mode. So in here where we do update and render worlds, you know, we know that we do have the camera, um, uh, I'm sorry, the mouse, because we know that information from the mouse P uh, that we generate, right? So we use the user input here to get that. So we should be able to pick entities with that as well. So for example, in here where we do um, render entities, uh, which happens inside, I think, um, should be like right here. I think it happens inside. Does it happen inside simulate? It must, which is weird. You can see it happening here inside Simulate. I wonder why it happens inside Simulate. I guess because the Sim region, you know, you can't render once you've closed the Sim region. But it still seems like you could have just put that out here. I mean, the fact that it's update and render entities, I guess, is probably the reason, right? So, you know, inside simulate, you're gonna do both at once. 
So I suppose that does make some sense. Uh, so anyway, we have a couple of choices here. You know, one of them is we could just do the the testing in line. And the other is not. Since we're rendering in line, I guess testing in line is fine too. But what we need to do is we need to pass the uh, mouse information down. Uh, because if we don't, there's no way we can pick it. Right. So inside simulate here, when we're going to do update and render entities, we need to pass some input information down to it, uh, which we can do this like this. Um, and we can say, you know, only do this if we actually got the input, you know, only do this if someone actually passed. That way they don't actually have to pass it to us if they don't want to, uh, which seems good, right? Um, and so then all we need to do is actually think about how we're going to uh, actually create that. And we have in debug mode, um, we already have sort of a notion uh, that we're going to have to map these things and do an unproject. In fact, there's an unproject here, right? Uh, and so inside the, imp the input, we have a clip space mouse P, which is this thing. Uh, and so in theory, if we just actually ask for this, we should get back what we expect for the clip space uh, mouse, that should already be correct. Um, and so then what we need to do is just figure out what the world distance is going to be. Now to figure out what the world distance is, what we want to do is measure how far along the camera Z axis you would have to go uh, in order to get to the place that we're going, right? Now we know that the world position of the entity, um, we know that the world position of the camera, which we actually have, because if you look at uh, inside the renderer, you know, we were careful to save this kind of information. So if you take a look at the, um, uh, like for example, uh, the render transform debug X, X form, you can see here that it has the position from which you are rendering um, uh, baked into it, right? And the projection matrix uh, there. So. I assume, and you know, I guess now that I think about it, I don't remember exactly how the render transform stuff is encoded. So I have to think about that, but it can't be entity based. It has to be camera based, I think. Um, in fact, because you know, you don't have any entity information when you're doing this here. So the, uh, the debug transform is gonna be the camera's position in there and the camera Z axis in here, right? Um, that's my contention anyway. So, and I'll verify that. Let me just go ahead and do that. Uh, so in here we say camera X, Y, Z, P. So let's see what we do with the camera P. There it is, right? So we just set those directly. So what we have uh, is inside this, the debug X form, and I could, you know, do this. Uh, and that way we actually have one of those. Uh, that we can uh, coherently access. So if I want to do the, uh, you know, from camera vector basically. So if I want to construct a vector that just goes from the camera point, um, which is this, uh, and I want it to go to the, um, you know, I want to go from the camera to the element that I'm testing. This would give me that vector. Now, I don't actually want that vector, and I'll talk about why in a second. Um, but if we want to get world distance from camera, oops, uh, to plug into this function, uh, then you have to ask yourself, well, okay, if I have a vector that goes from the camera to the entity, uh, I want to be able to take an inner product, right, to measure along the camera's um, z-axis. I want to be able to measure how long that vector is along the z-axis, because that's exactly what that will be, right? So I take the camera's z-axis and I measure, and I say, using that as the measurement, if I take the vector from where the camera is to where the entity is, how long is it? That gives me the distance in z. The problem with this is it's going, going to go the wrong way. The z-axis actually points backwards. It points like towards the viewer, right? So if the z-axis points backwards towards the viewer, 
the from camera is going to point forwards. When I do the inner product, it's going to be negative for things that are in front of the camera. So what I really want is the opposite, right? I want a two camera vector. So I want to say from the entity to the camera, that goes the same direction as the Z. So then I'm actually measuring uh, without having to do an additional negation there to get the right answer, right? Um, so that gives me now the ability to take the cursor in the world. So now I have where the cursor is in the world and I have where the uh, thing is in the world, right? I have both of those two things. So now what I can do is say, if I want to, I can actually figure out where in this, in that plane, I can figure out where the mouse cursor is in the plane of the entity, right? Um, so I can basically say like, you know, entity mouse P or something, right? Um, and the entity mouse P is equally simple. All I have to do is say, look, I know that I've got, um, I know that I've got a, a point in the world where the uh, entity is. And I know that I've got where the cursor is in the world in that same Z plane. You know what I mean? So if I take a entity to cursor vector, and I basically say, I have where the entity is. Uh, so I, I know the world P. And I just subtract that from where the cursor is. I get a vector that goes from the entity to the cursor. And then I can just dot product that with the X and Y axis of the camera, and I'm done. Right? So if I say uh, X form X, curse, uh, sorry, entity to cursor, X form Y, entity to cursor. Then I now have a location in space relative to the entity, and I can now test to see whether it falls inside uh, the dimension that I've specified. So if the entity mouse uh, P, so that, that measurement there, right? If the entity mouse P X um, <clears throat> is less than the world dim X, Uh, and the absolute value y is less than the world dim y, then I just know that I'm inside the rectangle, right? Uh, and if not, then I'm outside the rectangle, and that's the end of it. So it's basically just a 2D hit test, you know what I mean? Um, and so now we just have to debug it, right? Uh, and, and, and then we're good to go. Uh, so the first thing I want to do, so we're not awful, like you can see it sort of works, but it's not quite right. Um, you can see we're kind of a little bit off. It looks like our Y is messed up for some reason there. Why is our Y messed up? Did I do something strange with our Y? Probably not, but we'll see in a second. Uh, I would like to draw this line as well. Uh, we have a push line segment call, right? Um, so anyway, that's the fundamental construction. It's kind of just like hacky. I'm just like, let's just test this somehow. And that seems like a reasonable enough way to test. So I'm just going to debug that and we'll use that as our way of simple picking, you know, just like basic picking of the entities there. Um, so here's the render group. Here's uh, a texture for the line segment. Okay. Um, I guess that's fine. Uh, I don't remember how to specify uh, a texture that's just pure uh, white there. Um, there you go. Uh, so I want to go from the uh, camera, I'm sorry, from the entity position. Oh, <laughs> this again. So yeah, this is going to be annoying. So the fact that we're using this sort of offset transform thing is a little annoying because you can see I did it again. I, I had exactly the same bug. Um, this world P here, you know, it really wants to take into account um, when we're doing that, uh, what the transform, what the entity offset would be. Um, I don't, I really don't like that transform stuff. It just, it leads to all these bugs like that. And, you know, I don't know. I kind of feel like we shouldn't do it. It should just, the renderer should just work in world space here. I think would be better. 
Um, we'll have to see what we think of that, but I feel like that's just, it's just dumb. Uh, and so I feel like we should probably get rid of that because I hate having bugs like that. Um, I want this stuff to just always be in world space. So, you know, because of this, the entity transform thing, here we want to do just the piece offset because it's going to add that thing in. So, you know, it looks like that. Um, but then here where we do the push line segment, right? Um, I mean, let me pause this because I'm like, let me see if that just works. That might actually have been the only problem uh, because obviously that's just going to be offset. Everything's going to be offset incorrectly. Um, so we'll see. It still looks like our Y is wrong there. Uh, but it, it, it's pretty close, right? You can kind of see that like we're, it's just a Y, the Y is a little bit wrong. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why, pun intended. It's like both are a little big. Um, I guess one thing I don't know is, does this entity transform stuff have a scale in it? Uh, I assume it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't look like it does. Um, and so, yeah. Looks roughly correct. So here's a couple of things I would say also, I just wanna do this before I forget. Um, if the world distance from camera Z, uh, so if that's like less than the near clip plane basically, uh, which I don't know if we really articulate here uh, anywhere. Not really. Um, so what I'll basically say is if it's less than like some, some close value there or whatever, uh, we're not gonna look at it, right? So, you know, when we when we actually compute how far away this thing is, we're gonna we're not gonna look at things that are behind us, right? Uh, and that doesn't have anything to do with like we're not looking at. There are no things behind us in the current setup, so it's not relevant. But I just want to put that in there before I forget. So anyway, we got our X form in here. Uh, we then do our entity cursor. I want to draw that line so I can see it uh, and see if it's accurate. So there's the world position. Looks like that's just a color. To P is gonna be the entity to cursor is just cursor in world, I guess is where I would wanna draw that. Uh, and then the thickness can just be whatever. I don't know. It's probably too thick. It looks like current quads runs out of entries there but I'm not super sure why so here's push line segment oh because it doesn't actually get quads Right. Which is kind of annoying. Uh, yeah, that's kind of annoying. You want there to be a call where it'll actually do something for you there. I don't know why it doesn't, but. So 
so it looks like this was coming up. Uh, oh, sorry. What did I say? Um, so, you know, that's actually quite accurate. I mean, that's pegged right to the cursor. So I'm not quite sure why we're getting an error there. Uh, I guess, so one thing that's true is this is irrespective of the transform. So probably what I would say is, so we're not actually getting, like we don't actually have the delta in that, we don't actually know what the dimensions of that uh, rectangle are in that plane, is I guess, kind of one negative aspect of how this is being done. Um, so like, for example, in here, yeah, we can sort of see exactly what the problem is, where, you know, we're, we're looking at it side on, and here's that vector, it's totally, uh, it's totally wrong in terms of how it's being projected down. So I don't know how I want to do that. Um, I could project the mouse cursor onto the plane. It's just always hard to decide because since these things are not real 3D shapes, it's hard to, to know how you should be picking them, um, if that makes sense. Like normally you just raycast against the 3D shape, but there is no 3D shape. It's just kind of an abstract blob that's kind of stuck on the world. Um, if I did want to do that, I don't know if we ever wrote array intersects plane. Doesn't look like we did. Um, so we could write one of those and then just take the intersection of the camera vector with the plane instead and do it that way. Um, Is that better and worse than testing a box? Um, I mean, I guess the nice thing about doing a, the box test is the box test would work for the cubes too. So maybe we should just do the box test. Um, and then we just sort of make a fake box for the entity uh, in question and let the box test deal with it. Um, so if we want to do something like that, uh, you know, we can generate the ray ahead of time. So, you know, what I can do to generate the ray direction is actually pretty simple. We just use the same code that we have here, but we just do it in a slightly different way. So, you know, what I can do is say, all right, take, you know, before we start, let's generate a picking ray. Um, and so here I'll just say, uh, If you gave me a render group, uh, then what I'm going to do is take a picking ray, and the picking ray is going to go um, from the camera out into the world uh, by taking whatever the clip space is and just going one unit out. Because who cares? It's a ray. Right, so we will do the unproject like so. And then we'll just say, just normalize the vector from the camera to that point. And that's our picking ray. So if we have a picking ray, then what we can do is we can just Use the picking ray to intersect with a phantom box we construct, like a made-up box, basically. Um, and we just use that made-up box. Uh, we don't need to do any of this, really. Uh, 
but we do need to write, uh, oops, a little box intersection code. Um, so once we have this information here, we could basically, you know, fake uh, the dimensions of this box. Uh, and we can, for actual cubes, we could make it exact. Uh, but for other things, you know, we we can't. So we, ha you know, we have to fake it for sprites because they don't have a real shape. Um, so anyway, if we did that, then what we could do is just say like if uh, ray intersects box, um, and then we would just pass here's the world p, uh, here's the world dim, uh, and here's the picking ray. Uh, we know the picking origin as well. Um, uh, because, of course, it's just this. Because we're always starting from the camera. Right? Uh, so I think that's it. Um, and that would give us the ability to do it as if they were boxes, which seems a little better just having played with the laws like, oh yeah, right, you know, we don't, we want to be able to sort of still do it in pseudo 3D, even though things aren't 3D, I don't know, so which argues for the box construction to me. Um, and so if we did that, we just need to provide that actual function. Now there are some other things we would want to do here, I'll show you in a second. So we don't really want ray intersects box per se. Um, so we need to do a little bit more work there, but uh, at the moment, um, you know, it, it should still be okay. Now, the other thing I can do here is actually draw this as well. So, you know, I could just make sure our picking ray is correct. Um, I can do a push line segment that just says, let's draw the quad from the origin to the ray, um, or from zero, zero to the ray, just as a quick way of making sure that our picking ray is actually correct, because we don't really know that it is. Uh, so if I said, look, let's draw from, let's say, just the origin of the world, uh, and then uh, to the picking origin plus the picking ray, <clears throat> we should see that end at the end of the cursor, right? And that just lets us know that our picking ray isn't garbage, right? It, it, like that we actually did that work correctly. <clears throat> uh, so what I'll do is I'll just stub this in here, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what we want to do. Uh, so for right now, what I'll do is I'll just say, hey... Uh, you know, when you, oops, got the caps lock on there. Um, when you ask me, <clears throat> uh, to go from origin direction, uh, box P box radius, uh, I am just going to tell you that the result is you didn't hit anything, right? Um, and so that will just work in the sense that it will never actually queue the hit code and we can run the app uh, on its own, right? Oh, and we still have this stupid problem. Uh, I don't know what I want to... Uh, that, that, that's so weird. Do we have a way of calling that um, that accounts for its own quads? Like, why don't we have one of those uh, that accounts for its own quads? That just seems really strange. But we don't. Right? Like, we don't have that. Push line segment render group. So this will do it for us. Uh, from pre, from CF to P to CF and thickness. Um, so again, yeah, someday polish up the renderer. Um, what is this saying? Recursive, you're correct. That's what I actually wanted to say there. Uh, and so now at least we can just call that and not have to think about that uh, ugliness. 
Um, all right, so let's try to get this to be pegged to the correct location. Um, it looks like it basically is. Uh, so, I mean, I think we're okay there. Yeah. Um, all right. So if we have our picking array doing its little picking picky poo, uh, then what we need to do is have a way for this box stuff to do something reasonable. Uh, and so what I want to do here is just say, look, okay, we've got a world dim. Uh, we're going to push a rect outline on here and get that uh, highlighting in the case where uh, it actually needs to get hit. What we could also do is just show those irrespective and change the color. So that might be a little bit more fun at the start, just again, as we're debugging this. So let's suppose we said that the color was going to be black. Uh, and it only turns or uh, yellow when you actually hit the thing, when the mouse is actually uh, poking through, right? So we'll always draw the rectangle uh, and we'll just draw it uh, by passing the right color in there. So what's the complaint here? Um, oh, forgot the thickness, I guess. Uh, push return number group v3. Neither of these are the render transform version. Why did we get? Uh... Oh, do we not have? I want something that draws the outline of a cube. Push volume outline. I'm like this whole time I'm like being frustrated and I'm like, don't we, I, we, drew, we drew cages before. How come we can't draw them now? And I was like, well, that's why. All right, good. So then we could say that we've got this rectangle dimension here. That's what I wanted to pass in the first place. So that's much happier. Um, all right, good, good, good. Mystery solved. Um, so that's good. All right, cannot convert argument three to rectangle three. Uh, okay, that's fine. We can create a rectangle three. Let me just look really quickly. So it doesn't take a position, right? So it wants you to build a rectangle uh, three out of these two things. Um, so we just want to do a center radius, you know, center dimension, right? Like that. It's not really a radius, I guess. Should it be? We'll have to see. Um, I'm pretty sure we have one of these, yeah. So now we should see a bunch of little like floating black outline things, right? Uh, and, and that is what we see, which is good. Uh, <clears throat> and if we were to do this without, like instead of sprites, if we were to do this, like so, we were assuming sprites there, but let's assume, let's say that I just I don't uh, do the world dim stuff there. So let's suppose that what I actually did is I just go like, okay, um, let's actually create the outlines there. So it looks like those are radius calls and this is a dim call. So like I just want um, this world dim. It, it's really a world radius. You know what I'm saying? Uh, which is what I was planning for anyway. <clears throat> And so if we do that, what we want to do is, is when we create this rec center dim, we really want rec center half dim in that sense, because uh, it's the radius, not the diameter. Uh, and so now you can see we get those thick outlines around everything, which is what we want. Uh, and now what we want to see happen, and we'll ignore the sprites for a second, but what we want to see happen is I want to be able to pick those blocks, right? <clears throat> Uh, and so we have an optimized version of Ray Intersects Box that's made for batches and we're working on the lighting, but we don't really have one that's non-optimized. Um, 
so what I'd like to do here is just figure out some way to actually get this stuff uh, to be, you know, inside there. Like, let's just take a look at what we're doing here and see, because we kind of already worked that stuff out, right? So if you look at what we're doing here, uh, we have a box P, we already know what that is, and we have a box radius, and we already know what that is. So if we wanted to do a box min and a box max, we could do that exactly the same way we were doing it in our SIMD code. Uh, and similarly, if we want to do uh, this sort of nonsense here, we should be able to do that as well. Uh, if we are looking at what's going on here, the multiply by D though, um, <clears throat> That's a little bit saucier. So that's actually doing. That's actually doing something slightly more complicated here. So that pre-inverts the ray test, right? Like this. So it's effectively doing that. Uh, And so what it's doing here is it's saying, if I pre-invert and then I divide each of the uh, axes by the pre-invert, like, so I'm basically dividing each one by the ray stepping. Uh, then I can come up with which axis I would hit earliest. We don't really need an early out condition here, so this should be sufficient. So this is whether or not the hit actually hit. We don't care about the T inside. I don't think. Yeah, so I think we're really just looking at, look, if the hit is between here and the max is not on the earlier side of it. So this is basically the thing that says what's going on. So this, this is really what we're talking about here. Right, that's our T. Um, valid result. So that's this is like did we hit, right? Um, and so our max and mins are fine. This is the part that we're going to have a little bit of problem with. So this is effectively a Hadamard product here. I think that's correct. I'd have to re remember the alg algorithm that we were using there, which was kind of an accelerated box test, right? Um, but it's a little squinky. Um, let me go ahead and make this happen. Um, so this is doing a, an inversion. I don't know that we ever actually did that uh, in our in our routine where you could invert by a scalar, where you're basically saying, look, I want to uh, invert each element of my, my ray and go from there. Uh, so we have like divide 
looks like we did divide by a constant, but not be di divided. Uh, so let's let's just do it. So in order to do that, all we have to do is reverse the meaning of these two things, right? Um, so if we want to do this to each of our individual elements, uh, then what we want to do is say, well, okay, uh, B gets divided by AX, AY, and AZ, and produces the final result, right? Um, seems fine. I don't know that we ever did a min here. So one of the interesting things about that is we don't actually... We don't actually have a min that operates on vectors, right? Um, that does kind of seem good, though. So I feel like these things that we were taking for granted in the SIMD context, we probably should have them for our regular vectors as well. I mean, it just seems good, right? Like, um, if we do a min of A and B, like, it seems like you would want to just be able to do, look, that's min AX BX. It just maps over the vector. Right? Um, is min a macro? Like, is this? remember how we set that up. Right. So is minimum a macro? Yeah. So that's kind of annoying. This is again, just the C-ness of it all is kind of annoying. We can't really do what we would have wanted to do with min and max there, but you know, oh well. Uh, so in theory, that would do the intersection. I have to walk through that routine again and make sure some of it makes clear sense and other parts of it are a little bit, uh, they're like, okay, you've done some steps with the algebra there. Uh, and so I don't necessarily want to call that correct for now, but that's basically what we're dealing with. Um, so it looks like we translated it correctly because the picking is working. Um, and so then we just have to deal with the, the part that I was saying. We, we don't exactly want radio intersects box. So the reason we don't exactly want it is like if you look at what happens if I, you know, pick down the middle, all the hits all get recorded. So what I really want to do is actually provide the, the T value coming back. Um, and so in here, what we really want is something that's more like... Uh, you know, F32 result equals, you know, some value that's not going to sort properly. Uh, and so maybe what we do is we just say, look, the, the result would be F32 max. Um, and then, you know, we check to see if you did hit, oops. Uh, and if you did hit, then we will return you the actual hit in question. Uh, that way, when you do ray intersects box here, what we can do instead of doing it this way uh, is then go ahead and just, just pull this back out uh, to its own sort of, uh, well, you know what? It's really just the render that has to change. So in here, we can basically just take the best hit and then at the end, render the volume outline uh, in question, right? So what we would do there is again, just as we run through the entities, we would just say, look, which entity is the actual one that looks like the person's on top of and, and which piece index as well. Uh, so we can just say, look, you know, what's the hit entity index um, and what's the hit entity piece? Those are the two pieces of information we actually need. Uh, and what we can say is, uh, when we go through, we'll just track whichever one that is. Um, 
so in here, when we're actually uh, looking at the hits, uh, this also, we could roll this into the other loop too, which is kind of nice. So we'll just go ahead and do that uh, in a second here. But what we can then do is say, all right, when we do ray intersects box, uh, that'll give us back the T hit. Um, if the best hit is greater than the T hit, then we'll go ahead and grab it. Uh, so we'll just say at that point, grab the best hit. It's now that. Um, this is the entity we hit. Hello. Uh, and this is the piece that we hit. So now we know which one of those we actually hit. And now inside the render group, we can just say, well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, inside the test at the end, we can just say, well, all right, if there's a render group and uh, the best hit is not, you know, a nonsense value, then assume we hit something, we'll just pull out whatever that entity is and draw the, the piece in question, right? Now, we may want to make that a little easier on ourselves by just recording it because we can uh, hit P uh, and hit dim. Uh, that just seems nicer, uh, just to make it a little easier on ourselves. Uh, so I'm gonna do that too. So here we'll just do like uh, hit p equals world p, hit dim equals world radius. Uh, and then it'll just draw those. So we don't have an entity transform and that's fine because um, I don't really want one anyway. And I'm not sure how to get just a generic transform. I guess we would just say um, you know, I'm not sure which default transform we really want to use here. And so I couldn't really tell you. Uh, Should make that a rectangle too. So I want to play with that a little bit. I may just want to remove those transforms altogether too. Uh, I don't like them. Uh, I don't think they're good. Uh, but anyway, so now when we're doing picking, you can see like it only picks the closest hit, right? Um, and so that's nice because that means that we don't have to worry about that. So now let's see if we can make ourselves pick sprites because we're really not going to pick sprites now. Uh, and sprites are the main thing we want to pick. Like, it's nice to be able to pick entities because we probably will care about that, but I'd like to be able to pick the sprites as well. Um, and so what I'd like to do is roll this actually back up into the old routine. So instead of actually doing that as a separate pass, now when we're actually going through the piece indices here, what I'd like to do is, is uh, make that happen like sort of right in, in line with, with uh, retiring the pieces themselves. So when we do this, uh, we can now sort of have that happen as its own little pass when we're actually looking for input there. Uh, and so when this part happens, what we now know is that we have more information um, about what we might want to use because these paths that branch can now record what the world position and stuff like that should actually be. Uh, and that's good for us, right? So we know that the world P is always that. What we don't know is what the world radius actually is. Uh, and so if I was to say, look, let's get the world radius information, we'll stick that in here. Uh, when we come down through here, the lights, as you can see, uh, that'll just work. The cube version will just work. And so the only issue is this path here, which we don't know. Um, so in that case, what I can do is set these now to be uh, based on the, you know, sort of bogus values that we're just slamming in for sprites. So now it'll do that testing uh, and we'll be in good shape. Don't ask me why there's a color value being set there. We don't need that anymore. Uh, and so now in theory, we should be able to put in phantom boxes for each sprite that can be picked. Um, and those boxes are not gonna be exactly right, um, but you can see now we are picking them. Uh, and so uh, we'll probably need to do some work to make those more accurate for an individual sprites. 
probably by working with the bounds that we know from like looking at the bitmap and stuff like that. Uh, but like, let's say we go in here now, um, I should be able to pick, yeah, and I can, you know, I can pick like this sort of fake sprite uh, for the, the cat, right? Um, so there's the cat body and there's the, right? Uh, and so, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's not horrible. Uh, and so that's, that's basically allows us to reach in and get exactly what we want. Uh, so that's pretty easy. You know, that wasn't too bad. Uh, There's a little bit of fussing, but, but not too bad. And that would allow us to pick things. The only issue that we're going to have there is, again, like we don't know the right sizes of these things because we don't look at the bitmap dimensions, and we probably need to, right? Um, so that's one that's a little squinky uh, and, you know, probably busted. There's a lot of things that are busted about that and stuff we can fix now because one of the things you have to remember is the bitmap dimension stuff we now have all the time. So there's no reason to defer the amount of information back uh, on the bitmap front. We should just get the bitmap and look at what its actual thing is because even if it hasn't been loaded yet, its dimensions have. So it's not like we don't know where the bitmap is or how big it is. We just may not have its pixels. So there's no real reason not to have that information directly in there. Um, and so that's just a little stupid, right? Um, but anyway, other than that, I think we're in good shape. So now we can like click on these entities, you know, and we can, um, uh, you know, do whatever we want there and, and you know, who knows what, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and see about... Uh, now adding something where we could adjust information about one of these entities. So if I was to like pick one of the cat sprite ones or whatever, uh, and by the way, when we're doing this again, like I said, you know, it's, uh, it's a little confusing because I don't, When we have sprites stacked up on top of each other, we need to know how big the actual sprites are, and that's something that we're not really doing. Uh, so again, like this all kind of ties in. It'll get better uh, as we fix uh, and finish the placement routines, which is what we want to do anyway. So being able to pick uh, the, you know, the individual pieces will get better too. At the moment, let's say even what we could say is that even if we it was this crappy though like even if we never fixed it we actually do have an easy way of making this be sufficient uh because all we actually have to do to fix it uh is say look when i pick one of these then just give me like a hot key to cycle through the pieces right so it's actually not we only really need to pick entities we don't need to pick individual pieces anyway so it's fine, like this is way good enough uh, and it's exact for any actual 3D stuff and it's only a problem when we have these individual pieces because we don't really have tight bounds on them yet. When we had tight bounds, we might be fine with that too, but even then you might, you know, sprites layer in complex ways and, you know, especially like imagine a translucent sprite. So you don't even know which one you're picking. Did you want the one that you can see through to the back or did you want the one that was in the front? There's no real answer for those. Uh, so, you know, you, you probably would need something for disambiguation in those cases anyway. Um, and so that's kind of a separate issue too. Uh, but anyway, that's, you know, that's it and that's fine. So let's try and make something where we can actually adjust those uh, pieces of information. Uh, and, you know, uh, get it so that we can edit it in the game and just, it, it won't be saved. So it's like any work we do just gets thrown away, unfortunately. Um, but let's just get that working and then we can work on um, the next step after that, which is getting it through line uh, through the whole pipeline, right? So at the moment, I'm just looking. It looks like we got about 30 minutes left. Uh, is that right? Or did I go over time? How much time do we have? Does anyone know? How much time do I have? Am I over time? I'm not over time, right? I don't know how much time is left. This thing doesn't usually tell you how much time is left. Sixteen minutes into the queue. What? Really? I guess I don't have time left then. 
Never mind. Um, does anybody know what the actual time is? Because I started, I started at one o'clock, right? So no, we have 30 minutes left. Because I started, at, at the beginning of the stream, I was working on the hash thing, and I didn't start the timer. I moved the timer up to one o'clock, so I didn't start at noon. Insobot's probably going on the assumption that we actually started at the published time, but I actually started an hour later uh, because we were doing other non-handmade hero programming, right? I feel like I'm gonna be excited to do some more improvements to the lighting because the lighting is almost starting to be cool. Um, and when it becomes a little bit cooler than it is right now, I think it's going to be very cool. Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. Um, all right. So, yeah. So I guess what I want to do now is be able to like pick one of these things and just figure out some convenient way to, to talk about like the various points that are involved, right? Uh, so I want some way to like... Uh, take a thing and annotate it with points. Uh, I guess I don't know if I care if I can add points or not. Um, I'm not sure what I want to do here. I have no idea. So I'm just going to start doing something and we'll see what develops. I guess that's just how it's going to go. Um, so let's suppose uh, that I want to edit a bitmap thingy. So I want to be able to display uh, like some information about it and I want to be able to like uh like here's what here's what I want to do so one of the things we did in the importer right is uh inside world uh no asset so here's what I'm going to start with right so inside the asset importer, one of the things we did is there's a way of getting errors, right? So like you can uh, generate errors and the errors go on the file in question, right? And that sort of thing. Uh, and so like if there's parse errors in the name of the file or stuff like that, like it comes out and the bitmaps have, you know, errors in them or whatever, right? And so one of the things that I'm interested in is like, what if I just want to see those errors for a particular bitmap? So, so we're not even going to try and edit anything. Like what if I just, I just want to display something. So I want to be able to pick a bitmap in the world, right? And I want you to tell me, I want you to print out, you know, uh, what is what's the errors you recorded for that bitmap? I mean, that seems reasonable, right? And I mean, I guess I don't necessarily know if we have a way of telling which file a bitmap came from, but I think we do because I seem to recall in here when we actually have 
um, the assets themselves, right? They, they now store this little U32 pair, uh, which means that they know which file and which asset in which file they were. Um, so if you were to click like, uh, well, mm -mm. so we have a forward mapping, but we don't necessarily have a backward mapping. So we know what HHA it came from, but we don't necessarily know anything else about it. We do, however, have annotation for it. So if we put the errors into the annotation, then that would work, and that would work nicely, which is probably more what we would want anyway. And in fact, I'm not sure why we didn't do it that way. That seems good to me. So if we look at the HHA I'm looking at the file formats here. Uh, if we look at the HHA, like so for each one of the, the assets in question, uh, we have this annotation thing and we've got like this reserved uh, block here so we can actually add additional stuff. One of the things that we should probably add, I feel like, is just errors, right? So like, were there errors on the import of this thing? Uh, and that way you could, you could do two things. One is you can ask if there's any errors in a file and it will be like, yeah, here they are. Um, and the other is you can, uh, for any given asset, you can say, were there any, er any errors on this asset? or any warnings uh, on this asset that, you know, merit attention. That seems pretty good, right? So if I cut that down and say error offset or error stream offset and error stream uh, count, Right. Um, so if I just add one more in there, I can say, hey, here's the error stream offset and here's the error stream count. I can take two U64s away and just like put in one pad there and then nothing really has to change, right? The file format doesn't change at all. Uh, but I can do that and then I can actually look at errors. So I think that's good. Um, I don't really know if it's good or not, but it seems good. So if we look at like when we get the author here, right? When we read in one of these files, now I can just add another one of those. Like, okay, so here's the error stream. Uh, and I can say error stream offset and error stream count. Uh, and in theory, that should just make a thing. Right, I think. Uh, so I don't know if that needs to be, so when you write an HHA, uh, this is actually write HHA v2, right? Um, so if you write an HHA, when you write these, yeah, so we'd need to do one more of these as well. Uh, but I think other than that, 
it's just that was it and now you can just you can bake those in there if you want to and so at the end when you uh, when you go to import these um, I suppose when we dump we should also print those out so this is a little bit harder because if we go to print out the error stream uh, we kind of need to reformat the error stream at least a little bit if it has lots of lines in it in order to like not mess up our uh, output here so this is like Uh, something where we kind of have to take that a little more seriously than we were. Now we could, um, I mean, we could, I guess, just do it like this. Print out the header. Uh, and then we would have to essentially do like a for loop here where we loop over and try to get that data out uh, in some way. And so we would say something like, um, Something like, what's this, a uh, UMM? So we would say something like uh, count left equals, you know, whatever the, whatever the amount is we start with. And then we would just say, look, while we've got that remaining, um, or I suppose another way to do it would be uh, this way, start at zero, um, and just go till you find something. So you could say while it's left, uh, while it's you know has not exceeded uh, that size, and then I could say well you know for each of these things in here, uh, if it equals uh, if it equals the line end character then we'll print a line in. The other thing I could do is say, uh, if, uh, yeah, like if it is also the ending, uh, then print that too. Yeah, let's do it. So in here, if I go ahead and say, I'm starting at zero, uh, I need to know where the, uh, like I need to know where the start of what I would print would be. So the first thing is gonna be, you know, the first thing there, right? So I'm gonna start with this index and I'm gonna you know consider it going here and, and we got to do smaller than 64 bit here even though these are strings at some level all right so what I want to do is say let's start with the data in question we're going to uh, advance along it until we see ourselves hit the end of it uh, when we look at each individual uh, piece we're going to look to see if we've hit an end of line. And if we have, then we'll print from the base um, through to the current location, right? Uh, and I guess, you know what? I could do it like this. Uh, might be a little bit better, right? Uh, so what we're going to say here is take uh, whatever... Um, 
Maybe do it this way. Uh, so we know we want to print out wherever we are minus wherever we are starting, and we know that we need to go from the, uh, the base every time we print. So that's how we would print out one segment. And then what we would say is, okay, from then on, we are going to want to go uh, one forward, right? Uh, another way to do that would be to look at it like this, right? Uh, and so, yeah, not super confusing. It seems reasonable. So we just say, look, look, if it's an end of line, we print it uh, and then we skip the end of line character. Like we don't print that. Uh, particular character. Uh, otherwise, we just keep going forward. And so the only problem with this is we really need to be able to print, we want to be able to do this printout on the last one as well. So we want to be able to say, look, if it was one, um, we also need this end criteria in addition. So if it's the last thing, or if it was a backslash n, uh, then we need to do the print and we're done. When it is the last one, we have a little bit of an issue uh, because we want to be able to print the final character in the case where it wasn't a backslash n. So I think what we want to say there is this plus plus at can happen uh, early. So we can say, look, go one more than you were, before, you know, print one additional character. Uh, if it is a backslash n. I think that would do it for us. We'd have to look and see. Um, at the moment, it'll do nothing because there are no errors in our HHA files. Uh, so if I do, you know, a dump of one of these things, uh, let me do local. Uh, and then I look at the tab view of it. So I shouldn't see any of those because we don't save any error streams to disk, right? So you can see it doesn't really say anything. Um, and so what I'd like to do uh, is go ahead and see about actually putting something in there. So inside the asset system, when we actually import one of these things, Uh, let me see. So when we actually import one of these things, we have this error stream thing there. And the errors are currently stored not really on the actual files themselves, right? So... When we, like, the, the one thing that's a little bit mismatchy here is just that we have the concept that errors just happen on the import, but we don't really know which ass, to which assets they would correspond, right? Um, and so, like, in here, for example, you've got errors that apply to the whole file, uh, and you've got errors that only apply to a particular asset. And we don't really have a way of differentiating between those two things specifically, which we would like to do, right? So in one in in the plate and single tile export cases, the errors can all just go to the same place, and it's totally fine. Um, but in the other cases, we can't do that. You know. Uh. So I'm not sure how we want to report that. 
because we really have two we really have two places errors in that case like need to go right so I think what I would want to do there is say uh, well you know let's Let's just say that, like, all of these kind of errors, right? Um, in some sense, you just want any asset that was part of that import to have any file errors attached to it so you know that it's wrong it should be fixed eventually but the only problem with that is there are some errors that there are some situations that produce literally no assets so for example if you end up in a situation where the thing can't parse the file name at all then you don't really have a place to put those error messages other than to display them at the time because there's no other place to put them, right? You have to display them on import, like just on the screen or something um, because there's no way to actually capture the fact that that error happened. You can't just uh, bolt it onto the file somehow because that's not actually sufficient, right? Uh, so I guess what I would say is, you know, in the case where we do it here, uh, we know that the asset source files error stream uh, is being built up. And when we actually go to write the image to HHA, it's pretty easy to just bolt that on there. But we probably need, when we do this, we probably need to have another source of errors in addition to the file errors that we print. I guess that's what I'd say. Um, so in here, when we go to the, the stream stuff, uh, what I want to be able to do here um, is, you know, this thing creates these stream chunks, right? And Scott, like, here's all the stuff uh, that we, we put in there. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to do a, uh, one of these, like, write asset string calls, basically. Uh, but I want to be able to merge that data in. Uh, so what I want to do is is sort of have a write asset um, stream almost. Uh, and so, yeah, like if we look at what happens inside write asset string, you can see what goes on. Um, so I need to be able to do a reserve data for the entire size of the error stream. Uh, and then I need to be able to actually write the asset data that is the stream in question, right? And so what I want to do here is say that the that this uh, is going to be equal to whatever the total size is of both streams, right? Now, one of those streams is fictitious because I don't have it yet, but I know that I'm gonna have it, right? So I'll just make a dummy here um, and that dummy stream will have nothing, right? Uh, and so, you know, we'll call this the asset specific stream or whatever, like asset specific errors or something, right? So there's like asset errors and file errors, something like that. Um, so if I pipe the asset errors in here so that I can say, tell me how big this actually is. Uh, and then I also know that I've got the file errors themselves, right? So, cause that's another stream. I can see how big is the total set of errors and it'll just give me that. And then that's good. Then I can reserve that amount of space Uh, so that I say, all right, error stream counts. Uh, so the error stream offset is going to be reserved 
however much space I just said that I actually needed, right? Um, and then I just need to write into it. Uh, so then I just need to like copy stream. I don't know how you want to, it's, it's, it's really a, it's really a, a four eye loop over the stream here. Uh, so that's, that's how that would work. So if I want to loop over a particular stream, I need a utility here that would do that for me, right? Um, but I know otherwise exactly what's going on, right? I know that this is the offset uh, at which you would start writing. And uh, furthermore, I know that the, uh, the stream is the file error stream, the first one. Uh, and I probably need a thing here too that's the, uh, that's the uh, size in question uh, for whatever this error stream is here. So I need to know the file error stream size. So right here where I get those two things, um, I know that I need to reserve space for both streams that I'm going to do. Uh, so that's what I do. But then I, when I go to write them, I know that I need to write both streams like so. Uh, and I write one at the offset that is how far, how much space the other one would have already taken up. Right, uh, and so that's where the the uh, asset specific stream would go. So this would do that writing uh, in terms of the uh, the right size. I don't know if this thing ever has a way of finding out how big the entire thing is. It doesn't look like it. Um, to me, so I think we would need both of those functions. Um, so one of them is general purpose, one of them is not. So the right uh, stream part is not, right? Uh, what's this called? Uh, right string. Where's the, where is that function? There it is, right asset data. Uh, so I can call this right asset stream, and I just need to call this like multiple times, right? Uh, so I need, here's my file, uh, and I need my starting data offset, and then I need whatever the actual stream is. Uh, and then it's pretty straightforward, right? I'm just looping over these chunks. So I'm basically saying like, all right, uh, so whatever the first chunk is, Uh, I'm going to go through and I'm just going to write to the file each individual chunk. Um, and each time I'll just uh, move forward by however big the chunk actually is. And that's it. And that should just write it. And we need to uh, cast it down because it's going to be uh, too big, right? So this, these are going to be larger than we would allow. But we know that we're never doing buffers that big in this particular context. So that's OK, I think. Although, actually, this in this case, we're actually fine with that because we're actually tracking a 64-bit position. So while we would have to truncate the right, we could actually continue to move the pointer correctly, which is interesting in and of itself, I suppose. Um, so. Writing the asset stream is pretty easy, and similarly, getting the total size is also really easy, right? Because again, all it is is a loop over the stream to see how much space there actually is. Um, so all you really need to do is say, look, how big is this stream? You would say, well, the stream is however big all the chunks are if we add them together, right? Um, so that's it. I mean, it's a stupid function, barely even exists, uh, and it's just a case of, of having to do a loop over all of the chunks. Um, which may not be the most efficient thing in the world, but it's totally fine in our case because this is only for asset importing. We don't really care about that. So if we ask for get total size here uh, in handmade stream, let me just go ahead and 
Oops, get total size of the stream. We should now be able to ask for what the total size of the stream is and get it. Uh, we should also be able to produce uh, the right stuff here. I again have that you know this problem of not actually we don't actually handle um, 64 bits worth of space on any of these things. That's intentional. Uh, so anyway, when we actually do the uh, the asset data reserves, I don't really remember how that function works. So I want to make sure I'm passing the right parameters there. Just take a quick look. So we need assets, asset file, asset data size. That's, isn't that correct? Assets, oh, that's asset source file. So we actually need the asset data file in this case. Um, so that's a little bit different. So we actually need to do that. Uh, and this is right asset stream. So in theory now, when we do an import, it should actually put those errors into the file now, at least in theory. Um, we'll see. We can test it because right now there is some stuff spewed to that stream for no reason. Like we stuck this in there just to see, uh, I think, if anything happened. So I can force a re-import and see what happens. Right? If I delete the local HHA, it will rebuild. Um, oh, sorry, I have to actually make one. Uh, so if I tell it, hey, do some re-importing, it should do the re-importing, and in theory now it should dump the errors out to each individual asset. So any asset uh, that's in there will get a, an error stream. Um, and in theory, if I dump the error stream, Uh, I should see that now, maybe, uh, we hope, right? Uh, that doesn't look like our printout's working. So it looks like we actually sort of did do that correctly, but a printout doesn't look like it's working properly. So maybe I just screwed up that lip because I kind of threw that in there. It wasn't uh, particularly bright. So... <clears throat> that makes it pretty obvious. Obviously, we don't want those two things to both be true. We need only one of them to be true. Uh, let's try that one more time. Uh, so we're almost right, still a little bit um, busted, but this is great because now you can see what the errors are in a file uh, per, per thing, and I, I like that. Uh, the this looks like it's skipping but I'm not sure why Uh, because now we're doing that pre-increment. And I see. Yeah. It's the other way around. This is a not equal to, right? We're supposed to do the pre-increment only in the case where it's actually the final character. That's actually what we were supposed to do there. Um, so yeah, so that was just a little bit busted. So I think we're good now. The only thing is we, we need the backslash ends to be in the actual file, uh, in the actual errors. You can see that our errors don't have backslash ends on them, which is not good. Uh, so we need to fix that. Um, but otherwise, it looks like we're in good shape now, right? Um, and so one more check we might want to do. In here, if we find that there wasn't any actual thing to print, right? Um, so if essentially what we're saying here is like, okay, we got to the last character, um, but there wasn't anything to print. So if base is not equal to at, like we don't want to include an, an extra empty line for no reason, I guess is all I'm saying. Uh,
So something more like that. Not the prettiest loop in the world. I'll give you that. Um, so now are we better off? So I'm going to use four as an example. Uh, and now I'm just going to go in and fix some of our errors here uh, inside the asset streaming stuff. Um, so I'm just going to look at all of our out Fs and see which ones should have had like things at the end of them, right? Uh, so I'm going to take a quick spin through and just look at like out F. Yeah, that should be it one there. Um, <clears throat> So that looks pretty good. And so if we just get rid of the re-imported thing, because that doesn't really tell us any information is not an error, um, then what we should be able to do is now see like when we've actually got errors, uh, we should be able to see them only on files that actually had something go wrong. Uh, and so if I delete local.hha now um, and uh, create a dummy one, it'll force the re-export and now it should export our errors correctly and we should be able to see those errors nice and clean with no, uh, no fussing. Uh, so if I go ahead and, and uh, re-dump that file, like so, uh, we can now see probably errors where they exist, right? So now we see like tile errors that had, to, had stuff uh, happen to them or uh, whatever, and we know ones that don't, um, that didn't have that, right? Uh, so that's pretty good, and we can make a thing that just dumps the HHA, only the errors in the HHA too, but I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, and then what I want to be able to do now, next weekend, what I'll do is I'm going to make it so I can pick an entity and show those errors on, like, live, uh, and then we'll make something that allows us to edit the points. I think that's basically where I want to be at. So let's go to brief Q&A here. Um, just for a few minutes, five minutes or so. Is it possible to account for sprite opacity when selecting items? Position to be more intuitive. Is it useful to generate a more slim triangulation for sprites? Um, bo both of the answers is yes. So <clears throat> if you want to account for sprite opacity, you certainly can. What you have to do is when you uh, actually pick a point inside uh, the box, you have to then figure out what texture would be on that face and which face you're on, and then you have to go and look up into the bitmap. The way we're doing it right now, you really wouldn't want to do that because we're making fake boxes because we're, we're actually want to, we don't want to be able to pick sprites like from a debug view where they're not even facing the camera. So you really wouldn't want to do that. You want to just pretend there's a selection nub and you can just draw the selection nub if, you, if it's too hard to hit for a sprite and you want to just pick that, like a handle. Because otherwise it's going to be totally random. Um, if you were always picking sprites head on, then it makes a lot more sense to look at the opacity because then you could just say, well, I'm just picking pixel based and, and off you go. So, you know. Uh, as for generating slimmer triangulations for sprites, uh, it does help if you want to minimize overdraw and you have your sprites have a lot of empty space in them, yes, it, it can be very handy um, because it prevents the graphics card from having to iterate over uh, and do simple tests and like, hey, is there any alpha in this block of the texture? No, okay, skip it. 
um, but it doesn't have to do that check if you just never hit a railroad in the first place. So there's usually a sweet spot. Too much triangulation um, can be bad because then you're forcing too much stuff through the vertex pipe for no real benefit. But too little triangulation could also be bad. So we're probably a little under triangulated by doing quads. That's probably not enough triangulation. You could probably add a little more triangulation and get some speed wins. But you can't go too far. You have to, you know, pick a happy medium. Because if you put too much triangulation, then you're actually just slowing things down by forcing the graphics card to iterate over a lot more triangles and a lot more fractional pixels and stuff. And that's not good either. Instead of fussing with selecting the individual sprite parts, wouldn't it be handier to list them in a picked entity HUD? Uh, yeah, and that's sort of what I was saying. Like, just have a hotkey that, that allows me to walk through the parts quickly, and then I just don't care uh, about picking them exactly. Is the count inclusive with strings? In other words, do you really need the nested ifs in the line printer? Uh, yes, it is. It, well, I don't know what you mean by inclusive. Inclusive of what? You spend a lot of time optimizing the hash function, but is it worth it? Most of the time you calculate hashes when doing IO, which will always be significantly slower. So you'll save more time if you calculate the hash in parallel with IO. This way meow hash and SHA512 would have the same impact on runtime, despite meow hash being 80 times faster. Um, so I guess what I would say there is, uh, so definitely not. Um, Suggesting that IO is the primary bound for hashing doesn't really make any sense. Um, IO, in my experience, literally is never the... IO is almost never the problem, ever, with hashing. Um, I can't think of a time when I've ever been IO bound when I was using a hash. It's just not a use case uh, that I can even think of, actually. Uh, and the reason is because... In game development, that's not what you're doing. You are input bound on beginning your data processing. So when you have to load, say, a PNG, right, uh, or a PSD file, which is like typical, like a 1935, let's say, we load a PSD file, and that PSD file is like 160 megabytes or something, let's say. So we are input bound loading in the PSD because we got to wait to get 160 megabytes, right? So the best we can do is be processing some other file while we're loading that file in. So that is a given. But once you start processing and you look at the total amount of time it's going to take you to process the file if you've got it in memory, and turnaround time is critically important here. Remember, like, if an artist wants to see an update to something, you, need the, you want the turnaround time to be as small as possible. So once you've got the PSD in memory, now what you're doing is you're blowing out those uh, layers to individual tiles or chunks or however you're gonna process them. You need to hash each individual chunk and then you need to check to see whether that chunk is already a chunk that you've worked with before. So you're gonna look to a memory resonant hash table for a collision, right? And that hash table ain't gonna be that big, right? So the number of cache misses in walking that hash table isn't massive it's way less than the size of the thing that you're hashing. So not only is the thing that you're hashing in cache, and it's probably about 64K or 32K or something like that, not only is that already in memory, so you're hitting the cache the entire time. So you're not waiting at all when you're running the hash because you just produced the thing, but you're also about to not do anything on the back end. So you're using the hash to avoid having to actually do any I.O. because it's probably a duplicate that is exactly the same as the last time this thing was imported, but we don't know that it is yet because we haven't looked, right? Um, so no, like literally I.O. time is not a bottleneck at all in the part of the thing where the hash is being used. The things that are bottlenecks are usually LZ compression and hashing. That's usually the bottlenecks. Um, maybe sometimes bit entropy encoding, but not really compared to LZ in my experience.
Um, already be past the last character in the stream. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, you could be right. Maybe I can make that simpler. Again, the loop was, it was not a particularly attractive loop. I will give you that. Um, so I guess what I'd say here is, uh, once at equals the count, I guess, no, I, I can't see how you do it simpler. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this actually is the part that we don't need. Yeah, I think you're right. Good catch. Um, where's my tab view at? Why am I not seeing any errors at all? I'm looking at the wrong text file. There we go. Yeah. Good catch. Yeah, that's right. We didn't really actually have to do that. All right. Uh, I think we're good for now. Um, and yet, like, yeah, that... There's a lot of excuses about hashes that I don't super understand on that sort of on that last topic. A lot of people say like, well, it doesn't matter because it's hash because it's going to be memory bound, or this hash is memory bound anyway, or whatever. Almost no. There's only like two hashes I've ever profiled that are memory bound. Um, really, like almost every hash is not memory bound at all like they're not they're just not like they could be going faster than they are they're not memory bound they most of them hash at like four four bytes per cycle and could hash at eight bytes per cycle or six bytes per cycle if they were memory bound so that's not usually what it looks like to me um and the other thing is io bound but they're never io bound like you have to be doing a very weird specific case where you literally just read and hash, and that's the only thing you do, um, which is like disk utilities or something. Like I don't know what I don't know what case that is. Uh, I can't even think of what it is. Like I'm sure there is one. Like I don't mean to suggest there isn't a case where you're I/O bound with hashing, but it just I can't think of it. I certainly never have that case. Um, if there is something that's that's slowing down things that that makes the hash not relevant it's never io it's usually like uh some other heavyweight stream operation that's just much slower than a hash like you know if you wanted to optimal parse an lz or something and you're just like sitting there cranking away with all these tests or something right like i mean there's ways you can have stream processing be very slow and then it doesn't matter but it's just it's not it's one of those excuses that hashes are slow and, you know, they do slow things down. It's just, it's very hand wavy to say that like memory bandwidth is the issue or something. It's just not true. Um, so like I would much prefer meow hash always. It's just, it's not strong enough to really use always as your hash. And the problem at the moment is I just don't know how weak it actually is in data collision practice. So. 
you know, I don't know. I would love to just be able to use it always, but I don't know how strong it actually will prove to be. And so we would like to find ways of potentially strengthening it to be more cryptographic-ish. Um, just because the closer you can move towards cryptographic, the more assured you're going to be that you don't have spurious collisions when used in non-cryptographic cases. Uh, and so that's really, you know, the thing that's a, that's I would like to figure out if there's any way to do. But I haven't really found a way to get maximum throughput without um, with anything that can strengthen. I just haven't figured it out. So at the moment, uh, it's going to have to stay as a sort of like, you know, who knows, one in, you know, a hundred billion case uh, or whatever. Like, you know, I don't know what the actual practical collision rate is going to be. That one, again, also one of the big problems that you always have with with hashes is you're like hey uh what's the collision rate what's the expected random collision rate on this hash well you can't ever find it i mean if it's sufficiently high but still not that high like you know how are you let, let's say that meow hash was 40 bits or something right uh, you have to basically do a big data run to find those collisions. If if your hash is literally only like if your hash is literally only forty bits, meaning it's a forty bit hash, so your birthday rate is twenty bits, no problem. You can find that immediately um, just by testing, right? But if your hash has a probability of random collision of 44 bits, 42 bits, you're never going to find it, right? Um, and so going forward, knowing what that headroom is would be really nice. But, you know, finding it's really hard. Um, and especially in a case like Meow Ash, where you know, like, okay, so it's going to be the specific, the kinds of things that will collide are these specific things that have to do with AES 1 to 32 expansions kind of collisions. How often will those happen in practice? Nobody knows, right? Like, it, you just don't know. Um, so it's kind of annoying. That's why strengthening it a little would be nice if we could find some way to do it, because then we don't have to wonder about whether those things would happen in practice because you know then it, that wouldn't be a problem with the hash right so it's really tough it's just it's hashes are nasty that way they're really hard to know if it's a cryptographic hash it's much easier because then you just know if you found a hole then you can't use it right but with a non-cryptographic hash it's like bleh. i don't know I know this thing gets half as fast if I wanted to make it stronger. Is that a good decision? Possibly not, right? Uh, so who knows? All right. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for an episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you uh, would like to follow along at home, you can always pre order the game on handmadehero.org, and it comes with a source code so you can follow along at home. Uh, I'll be back next weekend. Wait. I don't know if I will be. Is it Thanksgiving weekend? We'll see. Uh, what's the schedule? So I don't... I haven't posted dates for that yet. This was the stream we just finished. Um, so I will post the schedule, and that is when I will be back. I got to see what my schedule looks like. But we'll be back either next weekend or the weekend after. Uh, and then we can play around with uh, viewing entity info and, and editing the entity info in some way. Uh, and when we're uh, done with that, then I think we can call ourselves officially done with the art importing process. Uh, and then I guess we got to go into start getting decoration stuff working. We're probably going to have to work on the world generator because we're going to have to generate, want to generate more stuff, uh, ground cover and furniture and stuff like that. And so, because we'll have those in there and um, we're going to have to figure out how to put them in the world in some meaningful way. All right. 
Uh, that's it for today. Hope to see you back here next time. Check the schedule for when that will be. Until then, have fun programming, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.